Brother Ayoy. Brother Ayoy is pastor of Oahu Baptist Church here in Chiang Mai, and he is now his brother. And we're glad to have him come today and sing for us. Glad that they could come and worship with us today. We have some prayer requests. Nala and I are going to be flying to Udon Thani for a meeting, a Bible conference meeting. And uh, we will leave on Wednesday and be back on Saturday, Lord willing. So you pray for our flight and pray that uh, the Lord might use us in the meeting as we preach the gospel there. And uh, I'm watching the time. I think we have time for just one or two verses of there is a fountain. Let's have prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee today that You've given us the privilege of being in the Lord's house on this the Lord's day. And as we think of the violence that's sweeping the world, we pray that your restraining hand might be upon those that are evil. We pray that you would move in some way according to your divine will to grant grace where it is needed. We pray, Lord, that the victory of truth might come forth and shine through all of this. We pray you'd be with all of our people, those that have afflictions, and grant them healing according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sing two verses or what? Yes. All right, you heard it. Two verses. First and second. Now, if you have a melody, just sing out. That I don't know how to do it. What's the number? Oh, 38. You're the one who told me. Okay, 38. Get over the fountains. Oki Samsit Bat. Oki Samsit Samsit Bat. 38. 38. Is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners blood beneath that blood turns all their guilty stains, turns all their guilty stains, turns all their guilty stains. Yes. 
destinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Thank you. Be seated, please. Our subject this morning is adoption. The question, how does one get into the family of God? Many years ago, and this is a true story, there was a ragged little newsboy. He was an orphan. And he was out delivering his papers. And he passed by a beautiful mansion. He looked with awe at that mansion with its manicured shrubbery and its closely mowed lawns. And he looked at the great columns that held the roof up and he looked at the beauty of the surroundings. And he was overcome with awe at what he had seen. And he walked up to the front door and on an impulse... As he laid his paper on the porch, he just rang the bell. And a man came to open the door immediately. A tall, gray-haired, distinguished man. And the little boy was taken back and he didn't know what to say. And he said, Mister, do you have a little boy? And the man looked at him a moment and he said, No, I don't have a little boy. And the little fellow said, You know... This is the most beautiful place. He said, I'd give anything I've got if I could live in a house like this and play on these lawns out here and nobody would chase me away. He said, I'd love to live in a place like this. And the man said, just a minute. And he turned and he called his wife. She came to the head of the stairs and he said, Dear, would you like to have a little boy? She looked down at him and the little boy and she took it in in a moment what was going on. And she said, yes, I'd like to have a little boy. And the man turned to the little urchin and he said, son, come on in. And the little boy went in. And he said to the little boy, we're going to go down in the morning and adopt you. We will fill out the papers and you will be our heir. And you will be our son. We're adopting you into our family. That family was the Lowry family. One of the richest families in Chicago. And that little boy grew up and inherited the fortune of Mr. Lowry. All by the grace of God. The little boy remembering his promise as he stepped in the house took out 14 pennies from his pocket and offered it to Mr. Lowry. And he said, Mr. Lowry, this is all I have, but I told you I'd give all I had to live in this house. Mr. Lowry said, son, you keep your money. You, we don't need it. We have more than enough for both of us. And I thought about that story as I thought of the subject of adoption. How does one get into the family of God? And we're told in uncertain terms exactly how we get into the family of God. Reading from Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 3 through 7, we read these words. We were chosen in Him. There is a great doctrine of election. God chose us. Then secondly, we read that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. There is a doctrine of sanctification in verse 4. And then we read in verse 5, having predestinated us. And that's the doctrine of predestination. And then we read in verse 5 also, under the adoption of children, and that's the doctrine of adoption. 
Then we read in verse 5 again, according to the pleasure, God's pleasure, according to His good will. And that is the sovereignty of God. According to His good pleasure and will. Now there are only two ways that we can enter the human family. That is by natural birth or by adoption. How does God place us in His family? Well, I'll give you the scripture for it. Look at verse 4 and 5. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him, in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. So how do we get into the family of God? By adoption. God has no natural children. He has one Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is one of the three persons of the divine trinity. But God has no natural children. So if he wants children from the human race, he has to adopt them. That's the only way of getting them into the family, is to adopt them into the family. That's how we get into the family of God, by adoption. You go to a hospital, there will be eight or ten little baskets. And in each little basket will be a little boy or a little girl. And there will be a man and his wife standing there looking in that glass window at those little babies. These little babies have been put up for adoption. And as they're looking at these little babies, the father says, I like that little guy right there. And the mother says, I like him too. Let's adopt him. And so they adopt him. They choose him. And they fill out the legal papers and they take that little fellow home and he becomes their son by adoption. And getting into the family of God is a legal matter. We are adopted legally by God into his family by adoption. Adoption is one of the great doctrines of the New Testament. And yet you seldom ever hear a sermon on adoption. You seldom ever hear anyone preaching about adoption. But it's a, it's a marvelous doctrine. It's heartrending to think that when we were orphans, estranged from God, separated from God, having no hope in this world, that the great eternal God looked down from heaven and saw us in our misery and chose us and elected us and adopted us for His own children. And today we are the children of God by adoption and by the new birth and by grace and by salvation. We're His children. Now this raises the question, how could God become our Father? There's an Old Testament passage in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3 and verse 19, that speaks of this adoption and regeneration. And the question is, how is it that we sinners, wicked and vile and ungodly and depraved, would find a place of favor among the children of God? And God asks this question, and then he answers the question in Jeremiah. But I said, how shall I put thee among the children? That's God's question. And here is his answer. And I said, thou shalt call me my father, and thou shalt not turn away from me. God is speaking here of the nation of Israel. 
thou shalt call thee my father. The Bible says no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. This is a prophecy of Israel's conversion, which is still future. Israel will be saved by the mighty grace of God. Man cannot work his way into the family of God. He cannot church his way into the family of God. He cannot baptize his way into the family of God. He cannot buy his way into the family of God. He cannot pray his way into the family of God. And he cannot religion his way into the family of God. None of those things will bring him into the family of God. But grace, working through adoption, brings him into the family of God. And we stand today the adopted sons and daughters of Almighty God. What a privilege. What an awesome thing that the great eternal God would love us and choose us while we were yet sinners to be His children. Now there's an order in this adoption, in the sequence. It goes like this. There's a chronological order. The theologians call it the Ordo Salutis. Adoption is God's will in eternity. Regeneration is the act of God's work in time. Adoption is the cause. Regeneration is the effect. Sinners are not adopted because they're regenerated. They're regenerated because they've been adopted. Adoption gives us the name of sons. Regeneration gives us the nature of sons. Adoption gives us the title to our inheritance. Regeneration fits us for it. Adoption is the son placing. The Greek word is the huiostasia. In the Greek, it means the son placing. Regeneration is the son making. Galatians 4, 6 says, Because ye are sons, that is in an adoptive legal sense, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts in a regenerating sense, crying, Abba, Father. When we pray, we say, Our Father, which art in heaven. Now the meaning of adoption. The word adoption comes from one, two Greek words, huios and thesia. When you put huios thesia together, it means the son placing. Huia means a son. Thesis means to place or to place as a son. And God places us as sons in his family. Adoption, as the term clearly implies, is an act of a transfer from an alien family into the family of God. The Bible says we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Now the word adoption is found only five times in the New Testament. And it's only used by the Apostle Paul. The word is not found in the Old Testament. But there are these examples. Romans 8.15. Romans 8.23. Galatians 4.5. Ephesians 1.5. And 1 John 3. 1, 2, and 10. I'll read Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, 
but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We have an inheritance. We are heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us. In 1 John 3, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. I used to have a lady in my church. She came from a background of another religion which was a little off the mark. And she would always pray, and Lord, at the last, save us. I said to her one day, you don't wait until the last. You ask Him to save you now. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, or how we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Someday the sons of God will all be gathered home to glory, and they will see the Lord Jesus as He is. They will see Him seated on the throne in august glory. And we will bow in humble adoration before Him. God has a great family. Some of them haven't been born yet. Some are in heaven. Some are here on earth. God has a great family. Now don't confuse the family with the church. They're not the same thing. The kingdom and the church are two different things. And in Ephesians 3.14, For this cause, Paul says, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. His family consists of sons and daughters. Now there's a threefold sonship in Scripture. Angels are called sons of God, but they're a different class of beings. They're created beings. And in Job 38, the sons of God sang. The morning stars sang together. Job 38. This is sons of God in a creative sense. And then Israel as a nation is called my son in a national sense. And then the redeemed, those of us, are called sons of God in a redemptive sense. And there's a threefold adoption in time. In the past, God's purpose was adoption. In the present, God's action is adoption. And in the future sense, a new body will be promised to us. These scriptural truths seem to run in triads, that is, in threes. There are three separate spheres in which God is operating. There is the kingdom of God, the family of God, and the church of God. These are three different realms. We are born into the kingdom of God. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot see nor enter the kingdom of God. We're born into the kingdom. And then we're adopted into the family. We just read the scriptures of our adoption into the family of God. And then thirdly, we are baptized into the church of God. So there are three different realms there and we should not confuse them at all. We should also not confuse our sonship with His sonship. Jesus has a different sonship than ours. Although He became a part of the human race, His sonship pre-existed His manhood. He dwelled in eternity past as God the Son. And He never had a beginning. He is the Eternal One. 
And so His sonship is different from ours. We call Him our elder brother. And He is in His humanity. But in His deity, He never became the Son. He has always been the Son. Micah 5, 2 says, Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way. Now Micah was written hundreds of years before Christ took upon manhood through the virgin birth of Mary. That's an important distinction to make because many of the liberal preachers today are trying to make Jesus an adopted son. Jesus was never adopted. He's always been God's son. In Hebrews chapter 1, we read, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now that day is the day of eternity, which doesn't have a beginning. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Now when a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon knocks on your door and begins to peddle literature to you and wants to read the Bible to you, Ask them if they believe Jesus is the Son of God. And they'll say, oh yes, we do. Then ask them, do you believe He's God the Son? And they'll say, oh no. You see, they try to fool people by claiming that He's the Son of God, but then they turn right around and deny that He's God the Son. They deny His deity. They deny that He's God Almighty. And they're not saved. And here's the verse that you need to give them. Chapter 1 and verse 8. But unto the Son, He saith, Thy throne, O God. What up asked me one day at the door? He said, If you can show me one verse of Scripture where the Bible says that Jesus is God, then they said, I'll quit the Jehovah Witnesses and join you Baptists. I said, Really? You would do that? Yeah, if you can show me one Scripture where it says Jesus is God. I said, sir, I just happen to have such a scripture. And I opened my Bible and I read him this verse. But under the Son, that's the, the Son of God, the Father is speaking here. He, the Father, saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and forever. I said, are you ready to be a Baptist? Oh, no, no, no. He said, he ran off. You see, the proof was presented to him. He wouldn't accept it. He lied to me. He thought he was being, you know, really smart by challenging me to show him something that he didn't know was in there. Evidently, he had never read the Bible much. Jesus is the eternal Son of the living God, and He is God, the eternal God. And you can't make Him any less than God. He is God Almighty. There are three persons in the divine Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But there is only one God. You say that's a contradiction. No, it's only a lack of your ability to fathom the depths of God Himself. We have finite in finite minds. God is an infinite God. And our finite minds cannot reach high enough to discern and understand and know how one could be three and three could be one. But you see, we're not saved by intelligence. We're saved by grace. And grace tells us that there are three persons in the Trinity, but only one God. And don't use human illustrations. Human illustrations break down 
They don't go far enough. You don't have human illustrations that can explain this. You take it on faith because the God who cannot lie said it. We believe the Bible. It is the word of the living God. And for thousands of years, men have tried to tear the Bible down and find discrepancies, and they have never yet found it. There's not one error in the Bible. You cannot find errors in the Word of God. The Hebrew and the Greek were divinely inspired by Almighty God. And there's never been an error found in the Greek or the Hebrew language in which our Bible was written. So we accept the Word of God. And the Word of God tells us about the Divine Trinity. When Jesus was being baptized in the Jordan River, there stands Jesus in the water. And the Spirit of God descended upon Him in the form of a dove. And the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye Him. So all three persons of the Trinity were separately manifested at the baptism of Jesus. That's good enough for me. I don't have to understand how electricity works. I go in the darkened bedroom and I know where the switch is and I flip the switch. I don't know how that electricity comes into the house. I don't need to know. I'm not an electrician. I don't care how it gets there as long as it gets there. And you see, I don't have to understand everything in the Bible or understand everything God does to believe Him. I believe Him. I believe Him because I'm saved. And every saved person will believe the Bible. Now in the fourth place, the time of adoption. I'm not going to spend time on that Sorry, because we don't have the time except to say that we were adopted in eternity past before he flung the worlds into space before by divine fiat he created the mountains and the lakes and the oceans he issued a decree a decree of adoption that these will be mine and I will elect them and choose them and adopt them. And in the time that's present, I will bring them to myself and make them my children. What a great thing God did for us. He could have left us alone. God doesn't owe salvation to anyone. He's not required to save anyone unless He chooses to. God has never been in debt to anyone. He doesn't owe the world a chance, as the Armenians tell us. They say God owes every man a chance. God doesn't owe any man anything. Man has sinned against the law, the holy law of God. And he's depraved. And he's lost. And he, he does not, God does not owe him anything. And if God chooses in grace and mercy to save that rebel, that's God's privilege. And that's how God works. People say, I don't like the way God works. Well, that's all right. You can go over my head and tell Him all about it if you want to. I don't think you're going to get anywhere. God is God. He does as He will. He adopts us, the Bible says, and I read it to you, according to the good pleasure of His will. Now, He's a loving God. A merciful God. If He wasn't, He would never have saved me. But His mercy goes out to sinners. And the call goes out. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, the only reason people go to hell is for their sin and because they don't want God. Now there's a wonderful thing about adoption. Did you know that in the law courts, an adopted son can never be disinherited? Can't do it. 
If you leave an inheritance to a son and then change your mind, that's too bad. If it's been legally ratified, you cannot take away his inheritance. And once God gives eternal life to a poor sinner, he never validates it, invalidates it, he never takes it away. I give unto my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish. Never means never. But what is? Forget the what is. Never means never. I give, that's grace, unto my sheep, that's my adopted ones, eternal life, and they shall never perish. That's what Jesus said. John chapter 10. If God has saved you, you have an inheritance. And if you think that little boy became rich when he met Mr. Lowry, it pales into insignificance when you think about how rich you are when you met Jesus. When you met Jesus, all that Jesus owns is yours. The Bible says we are joint heirs together with Jesus Christ. To think that all the possessions of this world which belong to Christ are also ours. When I look at the beautiful mountains and the beautiful lakes and the oceans, I say those belong to me. That's my property. Because it belongs to Christ. And I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. A joint heir. Now God didn't have to make us joint heirs. But he chose to. How rich we are this morning. And how poor are those that are not his. Here is the witness of adoption. Romans 8.14 for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Most religions hold their people through fear. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, wherein we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I have a witness in me that tells me I am a child of God. That's the Holy Spirit. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. For well, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Now, I'll mention briefly the four marks of God's children. When they get into the family of God, they're marked by four marks. Just as a cattleman brands his cattle with his brand, just as a sheep herder brands with paint his own sheep so that he can identify them from other sheep when they mix with other flocks, God puts His mark upon His people. And I'll briefly mention the four marks. There's the blood mark in Exodus 12, 13. Only God sees that mark. God has marked me, but you can't see the mark. Only God can see the blood mark. In Exodus chapter 12, we have the blood mark. Israel's in the land of Egypt. They're slaves in Egypt. God is going to pass over the land of Egypt that night. The death angel's going to smite every person where the blood has not been applied to the doorpost. You'll see the picture in the bulletin. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am Jehovah. 
I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. If you have a bulletin, please turn and look at that picture. This is what Israel had to do. They had to apply the blood to the doorpost. And God says in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 12, When I see the blood, you see, it's not for you to see. It's for God to see. I can't see the blood, but God sees it. I'm marked with the blood of Christ. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, that is in judgment, I won't fall upon you, I'll pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. God says I'm going to look for blood. And as I come over the land of Egypt tonight in judgment, wherever I see the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, I'll pass over. There'll be no judgment on that house. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 1 tells us, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, to sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And the Father goes in and closes the door and waits for midnight. He knows that death is coming over the land of Egypt at midnight. And God's promise is that if you put the blood of a slain lamb on the doorpost, there will be no judgment for you. The blood will shelter you. And He applies the blood on the doorpost. He goes in and shuts the door and the family waits. And the son says nervously, Father, are you sure you got the blood on the lintel? Yes, son, I put it on the lintel. Uh, Father, are you sure you put it on the doorpost? Yes, son, it's on the doorpost. The boy says, well, then I can relax. The blood will shelter us. That night a great wail goes up in the land of Egypt. And in every house where there was no blood, there was death of the firstborn. Every firstborn son in the land of Egypt dropped dead at midnight because they worshipped a God called Amen Ra, a false God. And I read an interesting little story, I believe I can get it in, by Dr. Harry Ironside. He was a great Bible teacher and a godly man. And he tells of an experience he had with an Indian, a Hopi Indian, in Arizona at a meeting. And I'm going to just read it to you quickly. It's entitled, How a Hopi Got the Mark. I have his book in my library. He said, as I reflect on the events of those days now long gone by, one sturdy Hopi witness for the Savior stands out vividly on memory's pages. Little Rattlesnake was his Indian name. The whites called him Frank Jenkins. He lived in the village of Moenkopi beyond the Painted Desert in northern Arizona. When he was a boy, he had gone to a government school at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, received a very good education. But he returned to his home, scorning the religion of the whites, because of their wicked ways. He thought the old Hopi rattlesnake worship was better. So he took part in the heathen ceremonies just as the ignorant pagans about him. But one night he had a vivid dream. He thought he was in his little stone house looking down on the village for he lived on a hill. As he looked, he saw that a strange excitement prevailed among the Indians below some unseen being was going through the village putting a mark, a red mark, on some of the people and passing by others. He put the mark on Mr. Frey, the missionary, and on Mrs. Frey, 
his good kind wife. The Indians who had left the old wicked life behind and had taken the Jesus way all got the mark. But the rest were left as they were. I asked him once, what kind of a mark was it, Frank? He replied, a mark like a Navajo puts on his sheep. Each sheep owner has his own way of marking the animals belonging to him using the red ochre paint for that purpose. Frank pondered over the strange sight. As he dreamed on and he felt there was something very important connected with the mark, and he hoped it would be placed upon him and his wife. The strange visitant, however, did not come near the house, and soon it was evident he had gone. Suddenly there was a great noise above, a great big shout, he told me, and in a moment all the people who had the mark were caught up in the air and gathered around a wonderful person who was brighter than the sun. Then all became dark below and little rattlesnake could hear the wailing of the people who were left behind, and his heart was filled with fear. He was so frightened that he awoke, but when he went to sleep, he dreamed it all again. Once more he awoke. It is God telling the Christians, telling me that the Christians are right. I too want the mark, he said. Again he slept, and the third time he dreamed the same dream. For days he was in distress. He knew that the conference was to be held at Camp Eldon. He came, and as he entered the preaching pavilion, I was speaking to a company of Indians and whites on the Passover and the blood mark on the doorposts and the lintels of Egypt. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, was Jehovah's word. Ah, oh, said little rattlesnake to himself in great agitation. That is it. That is the red mark I saw in my dream. I had quoted several scriptures speaking of the precious blood of Christ by which we are redeemed to God and which cleanses from all sin. And he exclaimed as he rose to his feet, I see it, I see it, I have got the mark. I did not know of his dream. So I was bewildered until he explained it to me. And that night he came to the Savior, confessing his sins, and was marked with the sign of redemption, the precious blood of Christ. Now we don't put much stock in dreams. But you know God is not confined. He can work any way he wants to. And in this particular instance, he chose to use that dream to awaken little Frank Rattlesnake to his realization of his need of being saved. That's the blood mark. And every adopted child of God has that blood mark. He can't see it, but God sees it. That's enough. Secondly, there's a suffering mark. The Christian life is not a bed of roses. When Norman Vincent Peale and these psychologists tell you that everything is just lovely, everything is not lovely in the Christian life. There's suffering, there's disappointment, there's heartaches. But with all of that, it's still the only way. But there is a suffering mark, and that's a mark that we see. We see our suffering. Job was an outstanding sufferer. And he said in chapter 16 and verse 12, I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. He hath also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark. Job said God has taken hold of me and shaken me to pieces. Sometimes God has to shake people to pieces nearly to get them to wake up. He says, God set me up for his target to, to be a mark, to shoot at. And it was true because God had set him up in a contest with the devil to let the devil shoot at him 
to prove that Job loved God. And then Job could say, Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation has preserved my spirit. No matter what Job went through, lost his wife, his children, his family, his possessions, his health, he lost everything but his faith in God. And when God was through testing him, he could say, Thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. Satan couldn't break Job down. He can't break us down, but he tries. So Job thanked God for three things. He thanked God for life. He thanked God for favor. And he thanked God for the visitation of his spirit. A mother dies. And the little girl goes to the preacher. And she says, Mr. Preacher, if Jesus loved me, why did he let my mother die? And the preacher said, I don't know. I don't know why he did that. But I know there is one who sits on the throne. And he sees and he observes it all. And he is one who loves you. And when you get home to heaven, he'll explain it all to you. As the old song goes, we'll understand it better by and by. We don't understand now why God lets things happen to us, but we'll understand it better by and by. Blessed be the God, even our Father, the Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. I have a poem. I love poetry. And I, I share this with you today. It's entitled, Why Roses Die. It's about a little girl coming to her father and asking why her roses died. She's questioning God. We ask and are answered not. And so we say, God is for God. Or else, there is no God. The years roll back and through a mist of tears, I see a child turn from her play and seek with eager feet the way that led to her father's knee. If God is wise and kind, said she, why did he let my roses die? A moment's pause, a smile, a sigh, and then, I do not know, my dear, some questions are not answered here. But is it wrong to ask? Not so, my child, that we should seek to know. Proves right to know beyond a doubt. And someday we shall yet find out why roses die. And then I wait, sure of my answer, soon or late. The key to life's great mystery and oh, so glad to leave it there, though my dead roses were so fair. The suffering mark. It's written all over us. We suffer, and we will. But through it all, He stands with us. Our time has come and gone. I'll have to close. The other two marks were the servitude mark, and the fourth one was the birthmark. You must be born again. I don't have time to fill those in for you, but maybe next time. Let's stand together, please. It may be here this morning that one has become a believer in Christ. You'd like to confess in public.
that you have become a Christian. Would you come as we sing this one verse of just as I am? Just as I am. Thank you.